Good evening, everyone. My name is Nancy Loudon Norman. I'm co-director here at Atlantic Center. I'd like to welcome all, you all here this evening. Um, it's really great that you're here to show the support for our artists in Residency 149. Um, from our Board of Trustees, to our members, to our new guests, we really appreciate your support of what we do here. Um, it's an amazing legacy, 149 residencies serving thousands and thousands of artists, and I want to thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. Hi, everyone. My name is Jim Frost. I'm the co-director here at ACA along with Nancy, and I'd just like to thank you all for attending. I'd like to thank our master artists in residence, Coco Fusco from the Visual Arts. <laughs> Judith Shayton, the composer. <laughs> and Jeff Dyer, <laughs> writers. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, the associate artists, because of course, without you, we would have no reason to bring these amazing artists here to Atlantic Center um, to work with all of you um, during this three-week process. It's really amazing. Even after 149 residencies, um, Nancy just had me write something for the newsletter this week where I realized that I started at residency 55. And it's even, it's so incredible to, you know, here it is, 149, I'm still inspired, still moved, still amazed to meet all these wonderful people, to work with these incredible master artists, and then to see so many people from the community come out and support what we do. So it's a special thank you to the associate artists for taking that risk of applying and then taking the extra risk of saying, yes, I will come to this residency and then hopefully having a wonderful experience here at Atlantic Center. So thank you all to you. Feel free to applaud. And now I will make, oh, welcome Catherine Ball. Way to sneak in late. Um, it's our community artist in residence there. Um, I want to make a special plug uh, for membership and support of Atlantic Center for the Arts. If every person in the history of Atlantic Center who attended an Inside Out became a $50 member, it would mean $477,000 a year annually to Atlantic Center for the Arts. That is a very powerful number for a very small amount of change, $50. Um, so I'd like to encourage anyone who's not a member to come out and join Atlantic Center for the Arts membership, become part of the family, and uh, become a great supporter of this wonderful organization. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce, who is it gonna be? It's gonna be Jeff Dyer. You're up first, here we go. Is it Jeff Dyer? Oh, it's hold it, we're gonna hold it, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're going right into the program. Thank you. Hi, my name is Josephine, and I'm with um, the Performance Artist Group with Coco Fusco. And um, the experience here has been um, overwhelming, and I'll never forget it. And I just put on a quick video of our experiences together, but it's Everyone, my name is Natalia Mali. Um, I'm a performance and visual artist. 
Um, I joined ACA three weeks ago. I uh, was the master artist Coco Fusco. And um, tonight I want to present um, uh, a small project that I uh, developed here um, with the Coca team. So I would like to um, thank uh, Coca team. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a little surprise I prepared for you um, uh, tonight. And uh, I also want to thank Gregory Kuhl. Is that the right way to pronounce it? <laughs> Cool, I like it. And um, Nick Conray, uh, Jason Holt, um, and everyone here. Um, um, I've, I've been very pleased to be here, part of this team. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Artist must be. Artist, artist. Artist, artist, Chukuma, Chukuma. Freya, Freya, Josephine, Josephine, Sandra, artist, must Sandra, be. artist, Daniel, Daniel. artist, Amber, Amber, artist, must Art. be, artist, Brazil. artist, artist, Natalia, artist, must be, artist, 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 must be. Daniel, Amber, Crescent, Amber, Natalia, Natalia, Artist must be. Hello there. Um, my name is Freya Olofsson. I'm from Middle of Canada, Winnipeg, Manitoba. And uh, I'm going to show a little bit of what I've been working on while I've been here, uh, which has been a true pleasure. Uh, so I've in the, been working in the black box. Uh, my background's initially in dance, um, but I work a lot with the physical body and technology, particularly mostly working with video. And so what I'm showing tonight is drafts towards, like drafts, they're not finished pieces. They're just little tests with working with the technology and gives you a sample of where the work is going. So I think that's all I'll say. That was almost all I was gonna say. Um, so I'll show one clip, I'll pause, and then I'll say a few more words and show the second clip.
I'm also in this process, I've been working with black light, which I didn't have here, but uh, behind me you can see uh, a touch of the footage with, I'm working with rhythmic gymnastics ribbons. So uh, I'm hoping to create a piece with these rhythmic gymnastic ribbons and black light, which make them quite neon. And to, uh, you won't see me performing with them though. If I wear all black, I disappear. So I'm just gonna show you a little brief clip of some of the tests I did here, which I, without the black light, but you get a sense of the idea. So hopefully. Great, hello everybody, and uh, for those of you who aren't living in the, in the compound at the moment, thank you for coming. Uh, it's been the most wonderful week. It's just been a source of great pleasure to look at the weather reports from London every day that I've been here. Where it's been pouring with rain. It's just been great to think of those poor people stuck there when I've been here uh, at the Atlantic Centre for the Arts. Uh, it's really been the most amazing week, and uh, if I know a lot of people want to give a lot of thanks, but I really do want to thank uh, Woody Igu, who invited me here in the first place, and then everybody that I've uh, uh, you know, met from the center uh, since I've been here. So it's, uh, I think, in order that I've met them, Nick Conroy, uh, I'm right, getting confused already, uh, Jill, Nancy, G the, the Jims, of course, Tom the Chef. So if I've forgotten any, uh, oh, and of course, the guy who, I've made so many demands on him that when I saw him, when I managed to collar him in the studio today, he actually, he actually sneaked into a closet to try to get away from me. Uh, so many thanks to Greg, who has solved everybody's tech. There was a great moment when, uh, when poor Matt Huff, the man who has cursed with these technological problems, last night things were going wrong, and Greg only had to approach the soundboard and the, the problem was magically solved. Uh, so thank you everyone um, like that. It's really been a, a wonderful thing in so many ways and I think sometimes the lessons of these great experiences are, are very simple and for many years I used to carry around in my wallet a quotation from the, uh, the Welsh writer uh, Raymond Williams, uh, somebody who has meant so much to me for, for so long. And he wrote very simply in, a, in an essay called Culture is Ordinary, published in 1958. And he said, we must emphasize not the ladder, but the common highway. Because every person's ignorance is a, co is every, excuse me, we must emphasize not the ladder, but the common highway. For, because every person's ignorance diminishes me, and every person's knowledge is a common gain of breath. And that is, I think, one of the things that this, uh, that this week has illustrated. Um, and I think that's it, really. Uh, there's just one other thing. There, there are only seven writers here tonight because um, Jamie uh, Brissick had, um, had to leave early just because of complications with his flight. Uh, but the thing is, um, as I think many of you will know, he suffered a terrible personal bereavement just six weeks ago. So I think it was incredibly courageous of him to come. And uh, we just all really appreciate his, um, you know, his incredible uh, energy and, you know, just his big-heartedness. Uh, and now the truth is it gives... Uh, who's next? <laughs> Let's see. Yes, that's right. Oh, it gives me no pleasure at all <laughs> to introduce the puppy Hunter Braithwaite who hum humiliated me in the 
what will I hope be a, a feature of um, future residences, the, uh, the Canaveral Beach 1500 meters race. He just didn't seem to care that I'm almost twice his age. He just crushed me like a bug is the truth. So here he is, the ruthless, up and coming Hunter Braithwaite. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone, for this. Um, my name's Hunter Braithwaite. I'm working on a project about living in a condo in Miami and the science fiction works of the British writer J.G. Ballard. So this is about um, the condo association draining my pool. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. Okay. So the pool deck was empty. The three fountains flanking the pool had been completely drained overnight and the pulsing hose lowered the water level with imperceptible yet deafening persistency. There was still water in the bottom, but, and this is Ballard quoting, the once mysterious world of wavering blue lines glimpsed through a cascade of bubbles now lay exposed in the morning light. The tiles were slippery with leaves and dirt, and the chromium ladder at the deep end, which had once vanished into a watery abyss, ended abruptly beside a pair of scummy rubber slippers. The layers of this image teetered in my mind. I grew up with swimming pools, am aware of their power, have been aware since my neighbor's two pet corgis drowned one day while the family was at church, their short-limbed corpses floating all afternoon like discarded broom ends. This passage is from Ballard's Empire of the Sun, the fictionalized account of his childhood in wartime Shanghai. But the pool he is describing, the one in his home on Amherst Avenue, now Panyu Lu, was never drained. According to his late memoir, Miracles of Life, the pool that disturbed him was at his next house, several miles away in the French concession. I happened to live in that Shanghai neighborhood for several years before moving to Miami and have noticed my memories of the city expanding and contracting to match his. Ballard's family moved to the French concession, Xu Hui in Mandarin, to escape the rough edges of the Japanese occupation. Out back was an empty swimming pool, a mysterious empty presence he said, which represented the unknown, a concept which had, no play, had played no part in my life, he says in Miracles of Life. Up until that point, his, his life had been made of knowns, but with a quick uncorking, this one had turned itself into an unknown. The empty pool formed Ballard's ability to rupture that sack of horror hidden within the commonplace. It also inverts the simple structuring binary of presence and absence. Turns it out like a sock, the writer once said actually in an interview with Thomas Frick earlier. Um, I walked up to the fountains and examined their rusting piping and good over tile floors. A few weeks earlier, I had realized that not only did the pool deck and the fountains have the classical indifference of a decurico, if, if I pulled my Ikea chair towards the edge of the balcony and looked down the 21 stories, my view was almost identical to the delights of the poet, 1913. Down on the deck, you don't get the same view, of course, but up in the balcony, you don't get that feeling of being in the painting. <laughs> Am I? Let me move this thing so I don't cast a shadow. In De Chirico's work, the shadows do not pass across the face of the plazas or empty streets. They keep still, allow the city to pass through them. In this one, there's a clock, and when you look at it, it seems the same size as your wristwatch at arm's length. There's the fountain, it looks just like my, mine. A man in white faces east, which is actually west. Based on the time, 2 p.m., and the angles of the shadows, we're facing south. But then again, this formulation assumes that De Chirico didn't fiddle with his accepted notions of time and astronomy. I'm not sure if that's the case. On the horizon, a train pulls into a station hidden behind the building with the clock. We know there's a station, although it's possible that somebody threw a couch on the tracks because de Chirico first painted the steam in a backward slanted smear, the evaporating traces of earlier motion, and then as an upward spewing heavy flume, leaving in our minds the clacking noise of a train coming to rest. He painted the steam with a meteorological eye. The earlier dispersed steam resembles cirrus clouds, while the more recent registers as cumulus. The name hints at the action of painting and the point of this work. This painting contains the accumulation of time spent arriving at the station. But just as the shadows do not all correspond to the same light sources, different elements of the canvas respects different, respect different chronological orders. The passage of time is important in the background, but in the foreground, in the dead, quiet plaza, we have come to a stop. Nothing moves, least of all the hands of the clock. 
To put the logic of the visible at the service of the invisible was Odilon Rudon's goal for surrealism and went on to serve Ballard well in his literature of inner space. Writing about a plaza of de Kirchhoff's, Ballard notes, the spaces within this painting contain, a contain an oppressive negative time, run through with an undefined anxiety, the buildings formed a catatonic, or catatonic withdrawal. This negative time begins with the slowing train on the horizon and ends with that cat catatonic stupor of the pool deck. For my apartment, there's no train. There are no train tracks. Just the crawl of I-95, but it crawls in the exact same spot. Thank you. Um, my name is Charles Conley. Uh, it's really been an honor to be here working with Jeff Dyer and the other writers. It, it's, it, the meetings have been fantastic. Um, I think I've learned a lot. I think I've taught a lot to you. Um, <laughs> makes me feel good. Um, the, the Atlantic Center has been fantastic and I, um, I'm really happy I'm here. Life is going to change after this. I'm going to have to get a job. So this has been a nice, uh, nice thing to do before that. Um, most importantly, it's been great to be down here to get away from all the publicity back at home. Most of you don't know that I published a couple of years ago a memoir. It was uh, very popular. And uh, down here I've been working on the, uh, the forward to the second edition. They're, they're doing a reprint. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that. I think, I think I finally got it right today. So this is the forward to the second edition. When I anticipated publishing my memoir, the fame and money were easy to imagine. It was a difficulty with friends and family and the constant legal wrangling that came as a complete shock. My publisher's legal counsel suggested that a short note appended before the text would help us to avoid any potential misunderstandings in the future and provide legal cover in the unlikely event these misunderstandings persist. I considered his proposal closely for several seconds before refusing. I explained to him, as I have done previously on TV and in print, that the most important aspect of the memoirist's craft is avoiding the kind of slavish adherence to the facts that obscures rather than reveals the larger dramatic and emotional truth. The gentle massaging of what I like to call events as they happened found in my memoir was always performed in the service of literature. Art justifies itself and makes no apologies. Legal counsel, counsel then further clar clarified its position, explaining that without the foreword, my memoir would be repackaged as a novel. <laughs> Obviously, I couldn't allow my memoir, a book that had repeatedly shown the ability to change, even to save lives, to wallow in obscurity on a fiction shelf. It would have been selfish and small-minded of me to hold so much potential good hostage to my artistic principles. So a few minor notes. Nikolai is a composite character drawn from aspects of three individuals I knew in real life. This is done for the sake of narrative flow and efficiency. Similarly, Aunt Betsy is a blending of two family members, one from my mother's side and one from my father's. This is a standard maneuver in memoir, as I assure you are the rest of the points that follow. All are similarly uninteresting, and I strongly encourage you to turn now directly to chapter one, at times the best of times. <laughs> For those still reading, chapter four, in a child's game, the man is revealed, describing that fateful Little League baseball season, consists of a combination of events from three different Youth League baseball seasons, not technically organized by the Little League TM, but by a local organization called the Firefighters Athletic Instructional League, FAIL. Two non-contiguous seasons I played, and one season played by my best friend at the time, who is known in the memoir as Hector. His name has been changed for reasons that will be obvious once you read the account of our eventual falling out in chapter six, waking from a dark dream into a darker reality. <laughs> this tightening of the time frame is necessary to heighten the sense of drama. We are all of us diminished by my being forced to mention it. For the, sack of, for the sake of accurately communicating its intensity to a readership that might be unfamiliar with the addictive power of video games, what was a severe Xbox 360 problem during the first half of 2006 is my heroin habit in the narrative. <laughs> All dollar figures are approximate as I kept no receipts from this difficult time. Rather than missing my parents' 40th wedding anniversary because I was strung out, I was 45 minutes late to my father's 68th birthday party because I was extremely close to getting past an important checkpoint in Half-Life 2. 
Any reference in the memoir to my sister is actually a reference to my brother. <laughs> when I mention incest, I am referring to times he told me to fuck myself, fuck off, fuck me, etc. <laughs> my description of being hit by a bullet is a metaphor for being struck forcefully by the violence at the core of the American character. One of the two or three most important motifs in the book and therefore in need of dramatic development in scene. The six months I spent in the hospital represent the six weeks I was afraid to approach within 50 yards any group of more than three adolescent males. A period of intense isolation for someone with a video game addiction. When I write that my mother committed suicide when I was five, I mean that she returned to her job as executive assistant to Frank Hoffernan, the wall-to-wall -wall carpet maven of Des Moines. I assure you the sense of abandonment could have been no more acute. When I refer to my absent father, I do mean he was absent, except when he wasn't running freight on his rig back and forth between Des Moines and Buffalo. Chapter nine, bottoming out, is completely fabricated. <laughs> Despite what urban legends and a certain brand of gritty independent cinema tell us, I'm not entirely convinced this kind of thing still happens, if it, if it ever did, at truck stops. Finally, in thanking the McDowell Colony, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Guggenheim Foundation for their support on my acknowledgments page, I never meant to imply that these organizations offered me any actual support. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the great Charles Conley, you're a difficult act to follow. Um, <laughs> hi everyone, my name's Virginia Lloyd, um, and I've been um, quite astounded at how um, inspired and uh, um, exciting this past three weeks has been working with uh, my colleagues in the writing group with Jeff Dyer. Um, I just want to say thank you to all the um, ACA staff who've um, looked after us um, remarkably. Um, well, um, so here we go. And this actually is a kind of a hybrid memoir, Charles. I hope you are, you know, will understand. Um, my mother's fingertips were stained mustard yellow from decades of rolling her own cigarettes. On the rare occasions when she smiled, she revealed a set of perfect false teeth, the colour of old piano keys. My grandmother lived forever away and I dreaded having to visit her. After what felt like three hours, we parked outside my grandmother's self-contained cottage in a retirement village on what in the late, in, late 1970s formed the western fringe of Sydney. Her relocation from Yeovil, a small town in the central west of New South Wales, had not been by choice. I leapt out of the car, relieved to be approaching the halfway mark of our round trip. Granny opened a front door and stood on the tiny landing outside it. With the solemnity of the Queen emerging onto the terrace at Buckingham Palace, she waited for us to attend, ascend to her. Despite her slippers and a nude coloured pantyhose, she affected a regal air. Go on, say hello, Dad urged. I walked up the little steps and stood on tiptoe to give her a kiss. When she brushed her lips against my cheek, they did not purse together or make any sound. Her grayish white whiskers tickled as I inhaled the tobacco on her clothes. She scared the hell out of me, but I had no choice other than to follow her inside, where the kettle was already on. By the time the rest of my family joined us, a pot of tea ensconced inside a crocheted cozy sat on the kitchen table like a caffeinated Trojan horse. Tell Granny your news, Dad prompted after a few minutes. I started learning the piano, I said, embarrassed. There was no piano inside the cottage, even though Dad was always telling me how his mother had taught piano when he was a child. Learning the piano? Granny's bushy white eyebrows shot up. The most important thing is to practice. She sucked at her false teeth. A ticking wall clock punctuated the uncomfortable quiet that descended. I could sense my father was disappointed, but perhaps he was not surprised. Neither he nor my Aunt Charlotte could play the piano. Their mother had taught other people's children, but not her own. A few years ago, I found myself once again with my parents on the outskirts of Western Sydney, paying a visit to an elderly woman. This time it was my Aunt Charlotte, my father's sister, who was living on Sydney's rural fringe. Once more, we sat down before the pot of tea that remained as essential at family gatherings as the cup of wine at communion. We had just returned from a visit to the house next door, where my 60-year-old cousin Bronwyn, Charlotte's daughter, lived. In an architectural echo of the notion that women grow up to look like their mothers, the two houses were exactly the same on the outside, though their respective interiors differed in layout. The collective glassy stare of my cousin's porcelain dolls had given me the creeps. They looked like something out of a horror movie, the infinite replication of an abstracted notion of beauty, frozen in an era when an intact hymen and the ability to play the piano 
rather than a trust fund and a degree from Harvard, represented ultimate social value. Rosy-cheeked maidens sat shoulder to shoulder in long, long silk dresses of block pink, lemon, mauve, and the inevitable white. All dressed up and nowhere to go, they gazed into a future that would never materialize. Sipping my tea, I could not decide which was more distressing, the size of Bronwyn's doll collection or the fact that she lived next door to her parents. Towards the end of the first cup, Charlotte leaned on wobbly knees and slowly stood up from the table. I've got something to show you, she said as she ambled in the direction of her study. In years past, this sort of threat would have announced the imminent bestowing of a homemade tapestry to shove in a drawer when I got home. Now in the late 80s, my aunt had discovered the internet and enthused ad tedium about obscure twigs of the family tree uncovered during her genealogical research. My aunt returned, clutching a bundle of documents comprising certificates and correspondence relating to her mother's musicianship. There were references to Alice's public appearances in Glasgow and letters of recommendation for her employment as a choir mistress. As Charlotte produced the documents, I found it difficult to believe that the subject of these certificates and recommendations was the same woman who, a little more than 10 years later, battled rabbit plagues and endless dust on a wheat farm in the middle of nowhere in New South Wales. What had happened to lead Alice in the opposite direction, geographically and professionally, from the one in which she had seemed headed? All her talent and experience seemed to disappear over the horizon with the SS Berrima, the ship she sailed on to Australia in 1921. That my grandmother taught other people's children for money but ignored her own son and daughter's musical education struck a false note. Was my grandmother's loss of feeling for music a result of financial circumstances, boredom, disappointment? Had the relentless Australian son bleached her of her passion for singing? If not, where did her emotional attachment to music go? I felt pulled toward Alice by what little I knew of her story and by the mystery of what I now realized I needed to know. Suddenly it was imperative that I seek to understand the young woman whose mask of old age had frightened me when I was just beginning my own musical journey. Thank you. I'm, here. I'm going to read the prologue to my book manuscript. Um, most of the book is chronological, but this prologue uh, actually um, is said fairly recently. A few paragraphs into it, I may appear to be name dropping to some people, but um, I want to assure you that, um, well, I met no one in this room until the residency, so it was written uh, earlier, that particular portion, with the name dropping. At any rate, Stand on the Rock. It's not unknown for three-time Grammy winner Lucinda Williams to interpolate other lyrics into the verses and refrains of her own compositions. But this is the Acura stage of New Orleans 2011 Jazz Fest, the tail end of a 75-minute early afternoon set, which hasn't gone all that swimmingly. The song into which she has inserted the phrase, Stand on the Rock, is called Get Right with God, which I've heard live dozens of times in over a decade's worth of Lucinda-inspired road trips. Today is balmy by early May Crescent City standards, and a black-clad, sun-glassed Lucinda has seemed in various states of unease from the 140 walk-on forward. Some fumbled lyrics set the title track of her recent release, Blessed Askew, and this is followed by Lucinda abandoning the microphone in the midst of the new song, Convince Me, the better to mouth some distressed words to her guitar tech and let her hard-working three-piece band continue unimpeded. If Lucinda Williams has given the impression, perhaps illusory, of being a somewhat jaded performer during the first half of her Acura stage appearance, then how much more need I come to terms with the possibility of being a jaded fan, a burnt-out middle-aged groupie? This book is not exactly my personal memoir. It's still less a biography of its title, Songstress Figure. My hope, though, is that it contains elements of both of these with spools of travel narrative and dashes of Americana uh, besides. What follows in my book captures only a fraction of the concerts I've attended in summers and on weekends, though I hope the material is representative. In Jeff Dyer's wonderfully hybrid book, Out of Sheer Rage, Wrestling with D.H. Lawrence, he spends a fair amount of time carping about the great British writer's dissatisfaction with domesticity and his urge to ramble. Yet Dyer himself admits to procrastination with his project 
and cannot seem to stay anchored in one place long enough to knock off successive chapters. I, in turn, have cultivated excuses to defer the at-hand business of writing about my complex subject. It's easier to sign on to yet another string of Lucinda concerts than sit still and analyze in prose her bewitching effects. Stand on the rock. There should be no surprise that such figurative phrases crop up in the stage persona of one who has crafted titles like get right with God, and atonement. We're referencing St. Peter here. We're beaming up the Holy Spirit. During one slate of shows around 2008, Lucinda and her band often interpolated lyrics from the Doors and Themic Riders on the Storm into her upbeat song, Joy. Get right with God needs no embellishment, but it's as if the artist has caught fire, if not brimstone, moments before her mandatory 255 walk-off. Now swaying, now grinning, she rhythmically inserts the metaphor twice over. You know you got to get right with God. Stand on the rock. Stand on the rock. It's as if the faulty microphone placement and the fluttering pages from her onstage songbook and her monitor woes and whatever else had plagued the more acoustic first part of the set has now been righted by the firm groove of something, tangible or intangible, secular or godly. She's signing off by shouting love and peace to us all. She's happy. Thanks. Hello. That's very promising to hear all the sounds running through the mixer, right? Um, my name is David Bird. I'm a composer. Um, I'll be playing a piece, or they'll be playing a piece um, called Nine Jewels. It's about it's six minutes long. Um, we were encouraged to write pieces for the other composers in the ensemble. And so I took this as an opportunity to write a piece in a completely different way that I've usually written pieces. And so what they have in front of them is an entirely text-based score. And this is something I've never done before. So it was an interesting opportunity to uh, try this out. So thank you.
Hi everybody, uh, my name is Brian Smolchik. Uh, I'm a composer, and uh, it's been really amazing to be here at the Atlantic Center these last couple weeks working uh, in these amazing facilities and meeting all of these incredible people. And um, one of the things I've been able to do while I'm here is uh, finish a piece that has, for various reasons, been uh, in progress for about two years. Uh, I don't know why, actually. But, um, so you're going to hear one movement from it. It's in three movements. It um, is for piano and poetry. It sets uh, the poems of a really great American poet named Lawrence Robb. Um, you're going to hear live piano, and you're going to hear the sound of his recorded voice reading his own poem. Uh, so this one is called The History of Forgetting. When Adam and Eve lived in the garden, they hadn't yet learned how to forget. For them, every day was the same day. Flowers opened, then closed. They went where the light told them to go. They slept when it left and did not dream. What could they have remembered who had never been children? Sometimes Adam felt a soreness in his side, but if this was pain, it didn't appear to require a name or suggest the idea that anything else might be taken away. The bright flowers unfolded swayed in the breeze. It was the snake, of course, who knew on that the past, that such a place could exist. He understood how people would yearn for whatever they so to survive, they need to forget. Soon, the garden will be gone, the snake will fall, and in time, God himself. These were the last days, Adam and Eve tending the luxurious plants, the snake watching from above. He knew what had to happen next. How persuasive was the taste of that apple. And then the history of forgetting would begin. Not at the moment of their leaving, the first time they looked back.
I'm Nathan Friedman, and this piece is actually an improvisation, but it's got a sort of a, uh, a general form, which is inherent when you uh, consider the materials I'm using. Uh, anyways, there's not really much to say about this uh, that you won't notice immediately, so thank you. the world in a blade of grass. I'm delighted to be part of a group that can hear the world in a balloon, in a skewer, and an eraser on a wood block. It's been really a joy to be here and to work with such a wonderful group of people. One of the things that I really wanted to do in assembling this group was to work with people who wanted to experiment and collaborate and to think about all the sonic possibilities in the world around them. And I also really enjoyed 
having them bring their instruments. And I want to thank them for their generosity to one another in participating in each other's pieces. That's rare and it's really been terrific. Of course, I want to thank all of those who keep this place humming, literally and figuratively. And also to mention, I first heard about the Atlantic Center for the Arts from students of mine years ago. And it's really wonderful to be here and to feel the ripple effects not only in the local community, and I think of the work being done by the community artists here, and also by the Atlantic Center and outreach to the local community, and also for its reach nationally and internationally. It's been really a joy to be part of it. Thank you. Um, this is my third time at ACA, so I must like it here. <laughs> but and actually, it's really been by far the best, I have to say, the best time, the most stimulating time, working with Jeff Dyer and the other, the other writers here, and also being among everyone else doing their thing. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It's a, great, it's a great way to work, I think, to have this kind of environment. So um, I've been, I started a new project here, uh, but there's nothing really I can read from that tonight. So I'm going to go back and read a little bit from my novel, The Iron Boys, which I was working on actually the first time I came and it was published at the end of 2011. It uh, takes place in the Luddite milieu in the early 1800s in England, and just briefly, it was a period of the Industrial Revolution and the factory system was invading the textile trades. And uh, for about two and a half years, these mysterious bands of people uh, who were never really identified would uh, dress up in costumes and raid factories and smash machinery and do all kinds of damage. And they really put quite a bit of fear into the, uh, the government of the time. But since not much is known about them, it was fun to just make it all up. And uh, this, this book is sort of a, a monologue, a kind of faux oral history. And I'm going to actually just read a brief part. It is a sermon, um, and it's briefly introduced by the narrator. You may have heard a sermon around here called God's Lace Arithmetic. Been preached and printed up so many times, most anyone can spin you off a sample till your ears need to take a breath. Sometimes called necessity of rich and poor. Here you go. The size of the demand for lace must intimately link to the quantity of money which the people of a country have to spend on it. And when this number is abundant, then much lace will of course be bought. And if the ready money found in purse and pocket sink, then so will sink the purchases of lace by similar degree, this much is clear. Yet there will always be some quantity of money, vast or somewhat less, to expend on lace, insofar as the lace itself, by its very existence, represents a will and a desire of human nature for its own benefit. How then can machinery possibly interfere with such a constant and imperishable desire for something that exists through will and desire? No, indeed. It can only be a lever and an amplifying pulley for the links of the chain already forged, as when, for instance, the sum we shall propose that the nation expend on lace be 100,000 pounds a year, for a number of yards we set at 500,000, and let us say as well that the making of the lace employs 2,500 families, then we must perforce acknowledge that the lace made by machines amounts to four shillings per yard, whereas the lace still stitched by hand adds up to 20 shillings per yard, and thus each can see for himself that the effect of breaking machines, even putting aside the cost of its repair, not to adduce where the machines have come from in the first instance, produces no advantage for the worker, as there is only the same 100,000 pounds a year to spend for lace. Thus there would be call for an ability to produce only 100,000 yards instead of 500,000 yards. And still there would be the same 2,500 families employed in lace making at 40 pounds a year for each. And clearly no improvement in these figures could arise from the destruction of lace machinery, whether violent or no, because as the quantity of money and the competency of desire for God's fine lace must remain the same, with adjustments only according to the population, which ever more increases, then the existence of the machinery itself cannot possibly do the journeyman any harm, but on the contrary, the journeyman himself is injured by his injurious behavior to machinery. Since, therefore, the same mixed sum of money and desire persists in our lace equation, then the handmaiden of reason must herself make clear that if machines were to be invented so as to produce lace for half or even one quarter of the present price, 
that by such an improvement there would be a greater quantity sold and wages would remain exactly the same and not a whit lower as is often claimed. So that God's lace arithmetic, as I have hereby shown, presents the prettiest pattern of constancy like unto the heavens in their own imperturbable and lace-like dominion. One need fear not that machinery and God are opposing forces. Fear not, I say, and say again, no, the two are twined in a never-stopping quest for ever greater amounts of perfection. Fear not, as we can say together, that glory, though singular and already perfect to God, can be greater to us here below as our divine machines make finer lace and faster lace and more lace. And fear not the finer and the faster and the more. These are the stepping stones on the way to the kingdom of heaven, which takes us awe bestricken straight before the very machineries of God, whose numbers of gears and levers interlinked be uncountable. Therefore, fear not. They do not and cannot and will not compose the number of the beast, as spitters and grumblers feel free to say, but let us say instead, and say a thousand, thousand, thousand times with me, God's grace is lace, and God's lace is grace. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Kristen Posehn. I've been on the writing residency with Jeff Dyer and I've appreciated my three weeks here so much. Um, tonight, I'm gonna read you also uh, from a past work. It's a short excerpt, um, an art catalog titled Reclamation. But first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. For the piece, I was both, both the artist who made the artwork and the writer for the catalog. Instead of an essay or art historical format, I wrote the catalog as one continuous story from the perspective of a fictional narrator. So events in the narrator's life are fictional, but all the information about the artwork, history, and the cities involved is true. I was drawn to make this work because as an artist and writer, I'm perhaps most interested in the personal, subjective experience of an artwork and how that can relate to a larger context. The narrator is using events in everyday life in, uh, to make sense of the artwork, and conversely, using the artwork to, make, to reflect on life in the city in which she lives. Both the artwork and the story take place in Almira, the Netherlands. Almira is just north of Amsterdam, and it's a new planned city, founded in 1976 and built on land reclaimed from the sea. At the point I'm going to read from, the narrator has just seen this artwork for the first time. Imagine an ar archway two stories high, standing on its own in an otherwise empty field. From a distance, the arch appears to be made of crumbling bricks and mortar. Up close, you see that the surface is actually an elaborate skin of photographs. One afternoon a year ago, I rode my bike along the cinema reef, and if the arch had been there, it would have been in the field to my right. A group of five young men cycled toward me in a tight formation. The leader slouched back on his seat in a way that communicated his lack of concern. At a distance of about 10 meters, he yelled a dirty slur. I paid no attention and continued riding towards him on the bike path. As he got closer, which happened very quickly, yelled more and more insults with snarling pleasure. My heart was pounding, but I didn't slow, show the slightest reaction. In the instant he passed me, he whipped out his hand and hit me square across the back with a rolled newspaper. I hadn't seen him carrying it. The cracking sound and blow to my back startled me. I felt fear and panic. Then I registered that there was no pain. It was the strangest sensation. They were gone behind me. I was breathing fast, and where the pain would have been, I was hollow, as empty in my core as that rolled newspaper. This memory came to me as I left the arch and biked to the art museum. The unusual architecture of museum de pavilions never failed to impress me. Five narrow steel sheds connected to each other via covered walkways. Modular pavilions which could be moved or recombined like chic German Legos. Each one stood on stilts, and despite the uneven ground, they joined together at the same height. Visitors were free to explore underneath the museum in the shadowy forest of eye beams, beer cans, cigarette butts, and sandy dirt. It was white inside, hushed. I asked the woman at the front desk for some information about the arch. She handed me three curious publications. 
The bold title of the Metropolis Chronicle caught my eye. The front page announced the first issue, volume one, number one, September 15th, 1911. Great future for Metropolis, ran the headline. Extent of present projects and prospective development of vast area attracting men and money. The paper was a reprinting of 16 covers from an old broadsheet published in Metropolis, Nevada, USA. The cover started with the first issue in 1911 and ended with the last in 1913. I folded the chronicle carefully and slid the papers into my bag. Metropolis, I thought, savoring the word, this was a town I could understand. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Eli Stein. Uh, I'm a composer and sound designer and programmer. And today I'm gonna present a piece that is for uh, motion reactive audio. So you'll see me over here. Uh, I'm gonna have to do a little testing before we start. You'll see me over here uh, moving my hands. Uh, and this is kind of a, a work in progress to extend this piece away from just the mo uh, motion of the hands to the full body. Um, I think that's about it. So we're gonna dim the lights. I'll do a little testing and then the piece will start.
Little Carol. Uh, the piece that we will be performing for you tonight is uh, entitled Not Idle Noise. Um, it is scored for clarinet, guitar, bassoon, woodblock, processed woodblock, and um, fixed media. Um, what to say? This is a sound walk composition. Um, basically, it's a narrative of me trying to find a quiet space to sit and reflect over the past few weeks here. Um, all of the audio source material was taken from field recordings while I was here. So it's all very local sounds. You'll hear the songs of the airplanes, the cicadas, um, and our favorite birds, the mockingbird, cardinal, crow, and morning dove. Um, the most incessant uh, bird song you'll hear in the piece is the cardinal. That is because it has greeted me 24-7 <laughs> while I've been here. Um, I want to thank uh, Judith and all of my uh, composer, performer, colleagues who have helped uh, bring this together. So thank you so much. Thank you. 
We're about to play I wrote here at Atlanta Center for the Arts. Um, I would like to thank the wonderful staff here including Nick and Greg. Um, as uh, what Jeff said is correct, they put up with our ridiculous demands all week so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to thank all of the amazing composer performers uh, up here who I've had the chance to work with and to Judith who's been so generous with her time and her insights into uh, my work and I'm sure the other people up here too. So uh, we're just going to check a few levels, so it might be a minute, um, and then we will play. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you. 
Everybody. Thank you very much for um, coming together to witness the creativity that has come to life during this really, really exceptionally wonderful residency. And I feel very privileged to have been given the opportunity to buy ACA to be here with all of you. Um, residences like this one allow artists to escape the pressures of daily life, focus on their art, and form a community. It's been a pleasure for me to share these last three weeks with everyone here, and it's also been really amazing to watch associate artists discover affinities with other members of this community and develop collaborations here. The performance art group began with discussions about the objects that each member brought here in order to catalyze an exchange. A pile of discarded chicken bones polished by Cuban sand and surf led to considering the structures that sustain us as human beings. Sales receipts assembled to form masks were used in collective spoken word exercises. Rhythmic gymnastic ribbons sparked hours of late night improvisation in this theater while I was away for the weekend. I wish I had been here. Individual interests led to group field trips to a shooting range to explore American gun culture and to the seaside to intervene in Florida's official anniversary celebration of its discovery by a Spanish conquistador. Our more musically inclined member filled collective workspaces with sound, and our dancer led group yoga practice. Unanticipated connections between the different artists' alter egos led to jointly produced videos and performative portraits. In short, we created more because we became more together than what we could be as individuals. Thanks to the ACA staff and its patrons whose diligence and graciousness make it possible for artists to enjoy precious time and space to create their work and to learn from being together. You've already enjoyed works here by two of the performance art group members, Natalia Mali and Freya Olofsson, our other members, Chukuma, Daniel Bejar, Gretel Rasua, Amber Hawk Swanson, Sandra Ibarra, and Josephine Turalba are presenting their works in the painting studio, and also Josephine has a video projected on, on the window of the field house. So I invite you to join us there after we finish here for a viewing. Um, but I'd also like to invite all the associate artists from Residency 149 to come up now on stage for a very well-deserved round of applause. So please, all of the associates, please come up. And the masters. <laughs> 